This is Wretched John, and I'm Ronnie Brown. John's father found out about his son's situation and quickly arrived to beg Navy authorities to release him. But his pleas fell on deaf ears. With war against France on the horizon, a young man with many years sailing experience was a valuable addition to an already inadequate crew. John was given a thorough and frightful introduction to naval service. Its harsh discipline ear-shattering cannons, and breathtaking duties high above the sea were new experiences for this young man. Yes, John had familiarity with sailing, but not on the scale of a man of war which dwarfed the merchant ships of his acquaintance. His meager knowledge did, however, earn him the rank of able seaman, just slightly above ordinary seamen. And after war with France was declared just a few weeks upon his arrival, John's father petitioned a naval friend to speak well of his son to the captain of the Harwich, Philip Carteret. This endeavor was successful, and John was raised to the rank of midshipman, which afforded him accommodations on the quarterdeck and some amount of ease and respect. But instead of counting his blessings and making the best of his situation, the young man was ill-tempered, moody, and disrespectful. His posting filled his head with pride and arrogance, causing him to lash out with severe treatment to those below his rank. Not to mention, his move to a complete apostasy from God came about this time through a companion whose shrewd protests and godless reasoning eventually shredded the last semblance of religious confidence he possessed, writing, quote, In a word, he so plied me with objections and arguments that my depraved heart was soon gained, and I entered into his plan with all my spirit. I renounced the hopes and comforts of the gospel." By December 1744, the Harwich was anchored in the Downs within just a few hours' riding distance from the Catlett's home in Chatham. Being so close to the object of his passion, John requested a day's shore leave, knowing all along that he could in no way pay a visit to the Catlets and return to the Harwich within a day. He was granted the leave, and he immediately made his way to Chatham. Upon his rather surprising arrival, the Catlets must have been alarmed, not only with his presence during a time of war, but with his obvious infatuation with their daughter, Polly, because by the end of his stay, which lengthened out to more than ten days, John had declared his love for Polly. Her reaction was less than enthusiastic, and the response of her parents was to adamantly refuse any further interaction between the two until permission had been given by John's father to pursue a course toward marriage. This parting must have surely been painful for the young man but it was nowhere near the pain that potentially faced him as he made his way back to the Harwich. Captain Carteret was incensed by the insubordination of his midshipmen and could have inflicted harsh corporal punishment or extreme disciplinary measures. But in response to some of the pleadings of John's fellow officers for leniency because of his youth, the captain let the infraction pass quietly. The only repercussion suffered by the young sailor was the loss of confidence and favor in the captain's eye. By this time, the Harwich was given orders to sail to the East Indies. This meant that the crew were ordered on what would easily become a five-year tour of duty. It was unthinkable for John that he would be parted from any chance of seeing Polly for that length of time. So several months later, while anchored in Plymouth, John plotted an escape from his military prison. John had learned 
that at the time he was anchored in Plymouth in April of 1745, his father was just a mere 30 miles away on business. He thought that if he could just get to his father, he could quickly board a ship to Africa and disappear completely. For this plan to work, John would need to somehow get to shore. Asking for another day's leave was out of the question. As it happens, a longboat was being sent ashore for food supplies. With a rash of recent desertions, Captain Carteret wanted to ensure that none of the crew ran away while on shore. So he, rather thoughtlessly, sent young John to accompany them with strict orders that none of the detail escape. Not long after they were ashore, John did just that. He was able to slip out of town undetected and with some hard walking made his way some 25 miles toward escape before he encountered a military patrol in search of deserters. He was promptly arrested and marched back to Plymouth. As he returned to the ship in chains, he no doubt feared for his life because desertion carried with it the death penalty. He could very well find himself hanging from a yardarm by the end of a rope. Although Captain Carteret was furious at the infraction, he was a humane man. Added to this, the appeal of an Admiral Medley, yet another friend of John's father, whom he called upon to beg for the life of his son, swayed the mind of the captain away from court-martial and execution towards a more punitive judgment. The young man would be publicly flogged and degraded in rank. A naval flogging consisted of gathering together the crew to watch as the offender would be tied to the ship's grating and their shirt removed. Then the boatswain's mate would take a nine-tailed whip with knotted ends and lay painful stripes across the back, very quickly bringing cuts, blood, and agony from the guilty sailor. Although we do not know the number of stripes given to John, we can be assured that Captain Carteret made it clear that no further desertions would be tolerated, and that the lashing was particularly vicious, seeing that the boatswain's mate had previously fell prey to John's haughty and vicious tongue. After several days in the infirmary to allow his wounds to heal, John was returned not to the quarterdeck or to the easy life of a midshipman, but to the lower deck as an ordinary seaman. The sailors on the lower deck were a mixed and dreadful lot. Many of them were criminals forced into the Navy rather than to be executed, and others were resentful, impressed men just like John. But all of them had a common disdain for the now humiliated young sailor. John was the object of constant bullying, intimidation, and insults of his shipmates, and his previous midshipman companions would have nothing to do with him. It was a miserable state, one which even caused him to consider taking his own life. There were only two things that kept him from doing so a murderous hatred toward Captain Carteret and his enduring love for Polly. As the Harwich pulled away toward its five-year voyage, John looked at his homeland fading on the horizon and was consumed with hopelessness. He wrote, quote, Yet nothing I either felt or feared distressed me so much as to see myself thus forcibly torn away from the object of my affections. Thus I was miserable on all hands, as could well be imagined. My breast was filled with the most excruciating passions, eager desire, bitter rage, and black despair. Every hour exposed me to some new insult and hardship, with no hope of relief or mitigation, no friend to take my part, nor to listen to my complaint. I cannot express with what wishfulness and regret I cast my last looks upon the English shore. I kept my eyes fixed upon it till, the ship's distance increasing, it insensibly disappeared. And when I could see it no longer, I was tempted to throw myself into the sea. But the secret hand of God restrained me." To John, 
death would surely be more welcome than spending a torturous five years upon a floating prison. But as with so many occasions in his life, a sudden turn of events would change everything in an unexpected direction. Three weeks after leaving Plymouth, the Harwich arrived in Madeira, an island off the coast of Portugal. This was an essential mid-Atlantic stop for ships sailing to the East Indies to make repairs and to purchase supplies. On the morning of their departure, May 9, 1745, John had ignored the morning wake-up call from the boatswain's whistle and was still fast asleep in his hammock. Realizing he was short a sailor, The midshipman in charge of the morning's inspection came down below decks to see what the matter was. Finding his former colleague sleeping, he somewhat jokingly called for him to get up. When John ignored this order, the midshipman took his knife and cut the hammock's rope, sending John crashing to the floor. In anger, he dressed and swiftly went on to the deck, where he saw one of his fellow seamen putting his belongings into a longboat stating that he had been discharged from the Harwich in order to board a nearby Guinea man, another name for a ship used for the transportation of slaves called the Pegasus. Much like being press-ganged, a naval captain had the authority to approach ships sailing under the English crown and commandeer any sailor for which the Majesty's Navy had need. So as to not leave the commercial vessel shorthanded, the naval captain would discharge sailors from the naval vessel to their service. Realizing that a second sailor would be needed to complete the exchange, John was overwhelmed with excitement and the sudden glimmer of hope to be released from his prison. After begging that the longboat be detained, he sprinted to the ship's officers and pleaded with them to intercede with the captain that he might be dismissed. These officers owed the disgraced sailor no favors, and John described his relationship with them at this time as being on ill terms with them. But for whatever reason, they had pity on the young man and prevailed upon Captain Carteret to dismiss John as part of the exchange. On top of this, the captain that, when previously given the opportunity to, refused to relinquish John under similar circumstances now assented to the recommendation and discharged John from the Royal Navy. Maybe he had had enough of the insolent, ill-tempered, and impetuous young man. Or maybe he viewed the boy as a lost cause, a detriment to the entire crew. But for whatever reason, from within a half an hour of his rude awakening at the morning, John found himself in a long boat discharged from the Royal Navy with the HMS Harwich at his back. Once arriving on the Pegasus, John was interviewed by the captain and was initially delighted to have the son of a respected sea captain aboard his ship, for he knew well John's father. But whatever excitement he had over his new crew member quickly wore off, for this young sailor proved to be far more trouble than he was worth. For whatever restraint military discipline may have held over his personal character and his actions, these all evaporated after his arrival on the Pegasus. John Lade recalled, quote, I well remember that while I was passing from one ship to another, I rejoiced in the exchange with this reflection that I might now be as abandoned as I pleased without any control. And from this time, I was exceedingly vile indeed. Little, if any, short of that animated description of an almost irrecoverable state. I not only sinned with a high hand myself, I made it my study to tempt and seduce others upon every occasion, end quote. He was careless insolent, and openly defiant. 
and toward a captain that had welcomed him with favor and proved to be lenient and patient amid his new sailor's disrespectful behavior, John thought up a witty song that ridiculed the captain's ship, his plans, and even his person. Then he went about teaching it to the whole ship's crew, openly mocking the ship's commander. During a period of the next six months, the ship had docked at Sierra Leone and points further along the windward coast of Africa, acquiring slaves for transportation to the West Indies and America. But just before setting sail, the captain of the Pegasus suddenly died, leaving the remainder of the voyage under the command of the first mate. Whatever sway the reputation of John's father had over the previous captain was lost on his successor. He had a disdain for the arrogant seaman, and John knew that when given the first opportunity, the new captain would put him back on a man of war, a fate to him more dreadful than death. Despite the danger of staying in Africa, where many a white man had died trying to make their fortune in the slave trade, John chased dreams of riches lodged into his mind by a man named Amos Clow. Clow was a wealthy passenger on board the Pegasus, of which he owned a quarter share. A few years earlier, he had come to the Guinea coast much like John, without a penny to his name. But by this time, he had become a man of substance through the trafficking of slaves. Twenty-year-old John was captivated by the idea of striking it rich in the same way. In 1745, before the Pegasus set sail for the West Indies, John signed on to be a slave-trading apprentice, while Amos Clow arranged for his release from the ship's crew. From there, John sailed with his new employer to the Plantain Islands just off the coast of Sierra Leone. One can imagine how his mind was filled with excitement at starting a lucrative career as a slave trader. But John was completely unaware that the darkest chapter of his life had just opened. Upon arriving at the Plantain Islands, John was introduced to Amos Clow's mistress, Princess P.I. She was a person of African royalty whose family ties had no doubt facilitated Clow's lucrative slave trade operation. For reasons completely unknown to John, the mistress had an instant contempt for her lover's new employee. But her attempts to satisfy her hatred for the young man were tempered by the presence of Clow, who had taken an initial liking to the industrious sailor. By this time, John's character had changed to some degree from all that had transpired since the beginning of his naval impressment. He had a more teachable and hopeful disposition, which was tempered with greed, and might have done well in his new situation had it not been for Clow's mistress. Not many months after arriving, Amos Clow made plans for he and his new apprentice to set out on the Rio Nuna on a slave trading venture. But before they left, John fell ill with fever. Too sick to make the trip, Clow had no choice but to leave him in the care of Princess P.I. Her care for his sickened condition was short-lived, and soon John was neglected altogether. Burning with fever for days on end, he was hard-pressed to even find a cup of water for his thirst. His crude lodging afforded him barely any comfort. When the fever passed and left him in a weakened condition, she hardly allowed food to keep him alive. In a matter of weeks, this strong young man was reduced to a helpless beggar. Of his situation, he later wrote, quote, Once... I well remember, I was called to receive this bounty from her own hand, but being exceedingly weak and feeble, I dropped the plate. Those who live in plenty can hardly conceive how this loss touched me. But she had the cruelty to laugh at my disappointment, 
and though the table was covered with dishes, she refused to give me any more, end quote. His hunger drove him to scrounge in the fields, digging up roots and eating them raw. This, in turn, compounded his condition, making him even sicker. Clow's mistress heaped upon John verbal abuse and cruel mockery. She would visit his bedside not to render aid, but to insult and ridicule him. She would call him worthless and lazy. She demanded that he walk, which he could hardly do. She then had her attending slaves mimic his faltering and stumbling steps, then clap their hands at him and laugh at his pathetic state. But when safely out of the prince's eye, these same slaves that were also encouraged to throw rotten fruit and rocks at John were those that would bring him small portions of their own meager rations in the darkness of the night, without which he would have certainly starved to death. When Amos Clow returned sometime later, his nightmare subsided somewhat for a brief time, only to worsen later. On the next journey, John was strong enough to leave with Clow, and initially things went well. But along the way, a rival slave trader claimed that John had been stealing from Clow. Admittedly, John's life was rife with immorality, but dishonesty might well be the only evil with which he could not be rightly charged. His honesty seemed to be the last remnants of a morality instilled by his mother. Although there was no evidence that John had stolen anything, Clow believed the charge and mercilessly imprisoned John for the rest of the journey. Through scorching sun and torrential rain, The pitiful prisoner wasted away trying to survive while being chained to the deck of the ship for two months. Years later, he wrote, The excessive cold and wet I endured in that voyage, and so soon after I had recovered from a long sickness, quite broke my constitution and my spirits. The later were soon restored, but the effects of the former still remain with me. Upon his return to the plantains, his treatment went unchanged. John was no longer a prized apprentice, but a despised slave. His miserable condition and humiliated state had broken him emotionally. Gone was the fierce stubbornness and arrogance he displayed on the Harwich. Although he was able to get a letter or two off the island in hopes of informing his father as to his horrific plight, He had no assurance that the letters would ever reach him. Over the months, his spirits sank to the lowest point of his life. He was so ashamed of his person that when a ship's boat came to the island, he would run and hide in the woods out of the sight of strangers. He was merely a shell of his former person and yet gave no thought of repentance toward God. He described himself as, quote, no different than a tiger tamed by hunger. Remove the occasion and he will be as wild as ever, end quote. John's story will continue with our next episode. Wretched John is a forgotten podcast special series and an Unseen Hand media production written and produced by me, Ronnie Brown. You can find out more about this show at ForgottenPodcast.com. I'm also on Facebook at Facebook.com slash ForgottenPodcast. Forgotten is available on all the most popular podcasting apps, so be sure to subscribe. Also, please stop in and leave a rating and review on iTunes. Lastly, this podcast would not be possible without an ever-growing group of generous supporters. To find out how you can support the Forgotten Podcast, just go to ForgottenPodcast.com support. And as always, thanks for listening.